Shalom, welcome to Eretz Israel. Today we're going to discover a very deep distinction. Why the, the rabbis teach us, the sages tell us, through the prophet, when Yechezkel said to the people thousands of years ago, he said, Atem kruim adam. Three words. You are called man. And the rabbis come along and say, Darshu, in Mesechet Yevamot, Atem kruim adam ve'en akum kruim adam. You are called man, but all those who serve the idols and worship the stars are not called human beings. We're not called man. Now, there are many different words for man in the holy language. Adam is one of them. Ish is another. Gever is another. There's several of these nicknames, if you will, are designating a different level of consciousness. Here, God says to the prophet to say to the people, you are called man. But those who turn to the stars, to astrology, to predicting the future based on non-centralized power, that is the one God, they're turning their pursuit of power of knowledge to something else. It's not the worst sin, right? It doesn't sound so bad. I need to know whether it's going to rain or not for my crops, and God doesn't answer me too regularly, and nor readily, and I need to know. Well, you need to know if there's going to be rain. And God says, have you prayed for rain? Have you prayed a lot for rain? Have you considered the fact that maybe I want to hold back the rain for other reasons? Have you sought the personal relationship with the Creator to be able to extract your wishes? Because Perky Avod says, you do His will and He will make others do your will. Others includes Him. If you do God's will, Many times, God will do your will. But this distinction about people who serve stars and constellations, it's not that they, they bow down to the stars. That, that might happen because they're so enthusiastic about what they believe is a power. The Kabbalah comes along and says, first of all, everything has an angel, which is a spiritual channel, which produces and continues the continuous renewal of anything on this planet, and that includes things like rivers have angels, mountains have angels, oceans have angels, flowers, trees. Everything has a spiritual channel to keep it itself for what are the allotted program of time that that item is here. And it's, it's a little bit mind-boggling to think about a mountain has an angel. Why? That mountain needs to talk to me through the angel. The mountain doesn't stay together as a mountain if it doesn't have an angel holding it together. It's a giant rock. Well, it's a lot more than a giant rock. But when we say that it, even something like a river or an ocean or, an, or a mountain has an angel, we're talking about the communication of its essence through a force from the creator to the creation that we are not independent entities flying around this universe and we are very well attached to the creator. And the moment we're not, the story's over. It doesn't mean we die. It means we disintegrate. We, we cease to exist because we are made of the things that he makes. So if you remove a person's brain cells, well, is he still there? Now, with all of that said, to be called a man, to be called a human being, this is not gender-specific, Adam. To be called that means don't serve idols. Just praise and rely on 
the one God. You need to know about the rain? Talk to God. You need to know about the rest of the year. You need to know about a family decision, a business decision, a travel decision. You talk to the man. That's called Adam, a human being. That is the difference between us. The rest of the creation communicates very well. We know that the trees communicate with each other in the forest. We know that animals communicate and birds and fish. And they're all communicating at their level of necessity. They don't need the holy tongue, the, the amazing, endless source of wisdom called Hebrew. They don't need that to communicate because their lives don't depend on that communication. Whereas if you're a Jew and you need to learn the Torah and you need to know the Torah and you need to know what God wants, then, then Hebrew is going to help you a lot. Now you can do it without Hebrew, but it's not the same. Okay. So to be called a human means that you have this relationship with the Creator and you put your faith and your trust and your reliance in Him. Meaning we take the shortcut through creation to get our information. And whereas if we take the intermediary here and we serve this idol or we you know, talk to the moon and expect the moon to answer us, or we look at the chart, it says the moon says, according to the moon now, it, it, where it's placed in the sky when I was born, etc. I'm supposed to be a certain type of person and therefore I shouldn't marry this other type of person. Well, that's very rigid actually because people change all the time. So even though you're born under a certain constellation and a certain star and a certain time of day and a certain house and a certain planet, those things are not rigid influences. They're fluid. They are flexible according to how we live and how we grow, or quite the opposite. That's called Adam. Adam is a being that is designed to be flexible, to be able to change according to the weather, according to the day or the night, according to all kinds of circumstances that we don't control, but we believe that God does. So if it's hot and you don't want it to be hot, you have to pray for shade. Or clouds, at least. Now, you could also just go inside and turn on the air conditioner. But we are beings that are interactive with the creation. And therefore, when we interact with the creator of the creation, we're going to the top of the pyramid. We're going to the king. We're not asking all the little servants below for help. Because God doesn't like that. It's actually taking away from his glory when we don't ask him for help. It's taking away from his reputation when we don't rely on him. And it confuses other people. And confusing other people is also considered in the Torah a way of misleading them, a mesit, it's called. And a person who misleads people is uh, incurs very severe penalties. All right. With all of that said, now Rabbi Nachman is going to, going to continue about this idea of man, we're being called man. Why? He tells us Kabbalistically, yes, Shivim on Neorin, there are 70 shining faces in the structure of creation. Shining faces means like open windows of God's wisdom and light. And Shivim on Pim Chashuchin, and 70 dark faces, the opposite inverted power. These 70 dark faces are feeding falsehood, lies, untruths, misinformation out into the world. So at any given time, both of these faces are, are activated and existent in the world. It depends on us to who, to which powers we channel through us. The 70 faces of light, which are corresponding to the 70 faces of Torah, or the 70 faces of darkness, which is according to the <clears throat> fallen spherot of the other side, which is another Kabbalistic concept, perhaps we'll get to. But to be sure, the other side is not far away. It's only about this far away, right? And we want to avoid that influence. 
But these two sets of faces are very important for our understanding of creation. There are two powers, two powers that our sages taught on a verse Zota Torah Sher Sam Moshe. This is the Torah that Moses put into the Jewish people. What is these what are these two powers? Two powers are the elixir of life and the potion of death. Pretty dramatic translations, at least. But psalm is a drug. But it's not like a drug you just buy in the drugstore. It's a power that permeates the world. And you either attract one or the other the elixir of life, you love life, you live life, you appreciate life, you share, you give, you learn, you grow, you give more and continue the process. You're looking forward to life, you're looking forward to the things that this planet has to offer and the human race has to enhance us with. And then there are people that are attached to the side of death. They, they literally think about death too much. It's good to think about it a little bit because it, sometimes it'll help us keep on the highway. But to think about death obsess, obsessively, that is death. You're channeling death of such a person. And people that do, they worry about the future and they worry about money and they worry about health and they worry, worry, worry is actually all coming coming from this thing we call the elixir of death, the, the poison. And a person has to merit, he has to do things that merit him to be attached to the side of life. Now, Samachim, Rabbi Nachman goes on, is these shining faces. Samachim, who on people, the dark faces. You know, there are people, you go out in the street, you can see them, they have shining faces, they're smiling, they're happy with everybody. They're not like showing a happy face because they want something. They're just happy. And the highest happiness is when you have no agenda behind it. Whereas the person who has a dark face, you see them on the street too. And they're, they're dark no matter what until, you know, okay, they win the lottery or something. Now, listen to what he tells us here. This is important. And he brings a verse from Echa, which is the Book of Lamentations, and he says, the dark faces, the, that's reflective of the verse of Meshachakim Hoshiveni Kemete Olam. Through the dark places you will bring me back. It sounds pretty positive. Through the dark places you will bring me back like the dead of the world. Like the bringing back of the dead. You think it's a simple thing to die, right? Well, you just leave your body. But where do you go then? Because we don't believe the, the, the divine soul dies. It has a journey. It has a mission to accomplish. Maybe many. And <clears throat> But when we die in the darkness, it's a journey back to the light, even in the metaphysical plane, which has many names. Uh, the levels of heaven is probably the easiest for us right now. It's a journey back to the holiness if we've lived an unholy life even after we die. And he tells us, And he tells us that the, the servers of idols and stars and constellations are connected to these dark faces. And, and all these nations, they have evil traits. Now, this is an interesting kind of international social perspective. Every nation has one trait where it, it is not good, and it's distinguished from the other traits it has and from the other nations. So some nations, they're very much into a particular type of behavior, or some nations people are more angry, more jealous, more uh, suspicious. There's all kinds of negative traits that people pick up, but they, they are organized according to nations, according to what they've done in the world. 
So these dark faces are connected to the, these bad traits. And he goes on to tell us, Ophia mehar Paran, and you will appear from the mountain of Paran, which is not far from here in middle Israel. God originally, guess what? He didn't want to give the Torah just to the Jews. He wanted to give the Torah to everyone. But not everybody wanted to receive the Torah. Why? Because they heard. They listened to rumors. Pick up the news and start the rumor mill going again. They heard they learned that the trait that they were really into. Asra Torah, the Torah said you can't have it. The Torah gives you ten commandments. Don't steal, don't kill, don't uh, covet your neighbor's wife, don't lust anything of the physical world, honor your parents, keep the Shabbat. They knew those things in its conceptual state of intuitive understanding that you know, why should a human being work seven days a week his whole life? Never have a day off? That doesn't sound smart. If you want a healthy people. So the people heard, the nations heard that the Torah had this and had that, and they all turned them down. And God wanted everybody to have the Torah. I wasn't supposed to, monotheism isn't just for Jews. It's for the whole race. One God, one people. But it didn't last too long. Because everybody wanted something else. But call me sheyesh bo midot ra'ot, and that the idea of wanting things that are against the Torah is what creates the bad traits. And anybody, this is very interesting. Anybody, let's say there's a certain people who are known for murder, and someone lives on the other side of the planet. And they also are attached to murder. They are underneath the system of that particular nation, even though it's, it's on the other side of the planet, it's still drawing life force through that filter that we're calling here for the sake of our discussion, murder. He's under it. Even if he's never met those people and doesn't speak their language and knows nothing. Because the people, the human race, they're, they're not just distinguished by where they live and what how what language they speak they're distinguished by the traits they have and how they live their lives so if i live my life according to people that don't eat meat i won't eat meat and i'm attached to them even if i'm elsewhere on the planet because there's energies that are being emitted from the non-physical plane remember all of this is is material that's dealing with the non-physical plane interacting with the physical plane and when you have that interaction you have that it's the spreading of influence according to traits not just according to who your parents were or what you ate as a child and that distinction is is very important And that creates, by the way, an affinity with a person with another nation, even though they're not connected because of the trade itself. And then each nation being attached to certain bad traits will attract those people who are also into those traits. Any person who leaves the Torah stops keeping the mitzvot. They give him something else to rule over him besides the Torah. If you don't want the, be God, God to be your king, you'll just get another king. That's malchut, that's kingship. And the, the yoke of working the land. The, the yoke of not making your living based on your relationship to God, but rather making your living based on your relationship to the land and who your best friend is and who your boss is and Etc. Etc. Ainu she ibud amalchut 
Begashmiut. And the Rebbe calls this the enslavement of materiality. So materiality, we don't want to be enslaved to the material. We're above the material. Our bodies are made of the material, but we're not from here. And when you understand that, you begin the journey of real freedom. The journey of real freedom means I don't want to be ruled by anything but my creator. And I bless you all with that insight and that the power and the commitment and the, the discipline and dedication to live that way. And you will find happiness in this world. God bless you all. We're going to continue with this hopefully tomorrow. God bless.